I know a lot of you use my podcast to fall asleep, and if you've been on the hunt for the ultimate sleep experience, then you're in for a treat. I'm talking about Manta Sleep, the creators of the world's most amazing sleep masks and functional sleep accessories. Manta Sleep is on a mission to give you more than just a good night's sleep. They're all about empowering your life through sleep and the magic of regular naps. And Manta Sleep is all about the pro-nap movement. They're taking a stand against hustle culture and giving naps the PR makeover they deserve. Naps beat coffee any day, hands down. I mean, have you ever experienced that second morning feeling after a power nap? It's like a reset button for your brain. And their product lineup is just as impressive. Picture this, 100% blackout for the deepest sleep, adjustable for a personalized fit, and materials that feel like a dream against your skin. And they've got a whole range. From masks that soothe your eyes and sinuses, like the Manta Cool Mask, to ones that alleviate stress and dry eyes, like the Manta Steam Mask. Plus, their weighted mask? Oh boy, that's like a warm hug on your face. And there's so many other options as well. Their Manta Silk Sleep Mask, it's not just luxurious, it's like a spa day for your eyes. It prevents wrinkles, refreshes your skin cells, and offers that true 100% blackout experience. And Manta Sleep is all about that high-tech comfort. Their Bluetooth headphones are incredible. Perforated materials for airflow, 20-hour battery life, that's like outlasting two cups of coffee and zero interruptions for a peaceful snooze while you listen to me. So friends, I'm thankful to have partnered with Manta Sleep today to hook you up. Head over to their website using the link below or the pinned comment and use the discount code Let's Read for an exclusive 10% off your order. I grew up in a pretty poor area of northeastern England, and since I didn't do very well in school, my prospects were always going to be quite limited. I fell into painting and decorating for a while, but in the end, I got sick of crap pay and crappier bosses, and I decided to go my own way. The trouble was, I couldn't really do anything else. The way I saw it, I had to either get really good at something, or be willing to do stuff that no one else would. And that's how I came up with my business idea. I now run a fairly successful, extreme cleaning agency that takes the jobs that other cleaning firms turn down. Our only two rules are that everything remains above board and legal, and we don't clean what we haven't seen. The last part is particularly important because I never used to operate that way. If someone agreed to pay my quote, I'd be over to the property in question at the drop of a hat, all my gear in my van ready to go. But eventually I learned the hard way about biting off more than I could chew. One morning, I get a call bright and early, but right away I can tell this one is a little bit different. Most of my calls came from locals or people only a little bit further afield. You could tell by their accents, which are quite distinct for this area, and the woman on the other end of the phone that morning sounded quite posh. She was giving it all that, I'm terribly awfully sorry to bother you, and then asked if I was free to do an emergency job that might last all day, depending on the manpower I had available. This was only the second year of me being self-employed, so I was still working alone, having sunk all my money into the specialist cleaning and safety equipment I needed. I actually did have a job lined up that afternoon, so I apologized and told the woman that we'd have to make it another day. The posh woman then started asking me, are you sure you can't reschedule your other appointment? I'm in an awful bind, and it'd be simply splendid if you could find the time to help me. I told her sorry again, but I just couldn't cancel on people at the last minute. There was a pause on the other end, and I swear on my nan's grave that she says, Whatever they're paying, I'll double it. Like I was a bloody hitman hired to bump her off. Double for the afternoon, then the same rate for the morning too, she'd said. I needed polished off today, you see. I asked if she was serious, and she said yes. Then I asked if she minded paying up front, and she agreed to that and all that. I felt like I just hit the jackpot. Yeah, I know, it's a bit sly to take advantage of desperate people, but if they're willing to pay, I'm willing to work. 
I got in touch with my afternoon job and was able to rearrange for later on in the week which freed me up for the high paying last minute one that had just come in. I then got myself over to the property, met the woman I thought was the owner, and she gave me the key. It's only then, right as she handed me a cash stuffed envelope, that I asked what I should be expecting, you know, just to get an idea of how bad it was. She says it wasn't all that bad on the inside, but that she needed someone discreet on the off chance that there were any items of a sensitive nature. That's the word she used, sensitive. And although I have no idea what she might be about, I definitely didn't like the way she said it. I told her if by sensitive items she meant anything illegal, I'd be out there in a flash on the phone to the police. She then reassures me that no, there'd be nothing strictly illegal in there, but that if I found anything, quote, of private or personal nature, again, her choice of words, not mine, I was to put it aside out of public view so it could be collected at a later date. I was mega suspicious, obviously. I'd had some weird jobs, and they were all weird jobs in their own way, I suppose, but this seemed extra, extra weird. And it was. After the lady put an envelope full of cash in my hand, half now, half when the job's done, and I'd counted it up and locked it away in the van, she gave me a key ring with a load of different keys on it, then left me to the job. I remember looking up at this big three-story house, crossing myself then unlocking the front door and walking inside to absolutely nothing. Some properties were so bad that I had to clear out the entrance hallway just to get my kit inside, while some are deceptively clean until you walk into the first room when, boom, you walk into a bird's nest with a massive pile of dung right underneath it. But I very soon found out that the place wasn't remotely filthy, more just untidy. But then I remembered all the stuff the woman had said about personal, private, or sensitive items. But then how terrible could it be? A few boxes, of nudie magazines, a gimp suit, something embarrassing like that? Whatever it was, it didn't fuss me in the slightest because if I ever got near it, touched it, or stumbled across it during my clean, I'd be wearing my tried and trusted gloves, mask, and overalls combination. I think my only real issue was how long the job might take to complete. Three floors, two bathrooms, four bedrooms. To get every room spick and span might take 12 hours, maybe a bit more. I could call in some help from a mate that I roped in from time to time, or I could work harder than I ever had in my life and walk away with just shy of two and a half grand. First thing I noticed when I walked into the house is that by the looks of things, it hadn't been redecorated since like the 1970s. The hallway carpet had this horrible kind of circular pattern on it, in red, brown, and orange colors, and it ran all the way up three flights of steep stairs. The wallpaper had a similar pattern on it, only with much lighter shades of yellow and orange. It honestly felt like I'd stepped back in time or something, and as I walked into the living room, I saw all the appliances were coming up 30 years old too. There was a big old cabinet TV in one corner, a record player in the other, and like I said before, it didn't look too filthy or abandoned, just untidy, like someone really old and infirm had been living there before they got moved into an old folks home or something. It didn't look like the cleaning would be too intense, but there certainly was a lot of it given that there were loads of rooms on three floors, so with that in mind, I got cracking immediately, starting with the living room. All I had to do there was wipe down the surfaces and shampoo the carpet. It's a powdered shampoo so it doesn't take forever and there's no risk of a damp smell afterwards. But before that, I had to clear out all kinds of clutter, and some of that clutter were these old magazines. They were strewn all over the coffee table and I was halfway into throwing them into a bin bag when I realized the dates on them. They were all from the early 80s, every single one, and that was around the time it dawned on me that I was in a kind of living museum almost. Absolutely everything, including the old style landline telephone, to all the old kitchen fittings, all looked like they'd been deliberately preserved to suit a certain period of time, like they'd made an effort not to include anything too modern. It was quite impressive in a weird way and I thought that they must have been some kind of enthusiast from that era or something like that. Nothing else made really any sense, because 
someone had clearly been living in the place. Last thing I did before I started on the second floor was clean the kitchen, which, again, wasn't too heavy of a job, but it was just odd that everything looked so dated. On the way out, I thought I'd check the fridge and freezer to make sure that they were empty, and they were, except for one half-empty jar of piccalilli at the back of the top shelf. I reached in, took it out, then, before lashing it into a bin bag, I checked the best before date on the side of the jar. I can't remember the exact date, but it was sometime in the early 80s, just like the magazines I'd thrown away. I didn't know what Piccalilli was at the time, so the fact that it hadn't mutated after 20 years, even having been sat in the fridge, it actually made me panic a little bit, until I realized two things. Number one, you could print out an old label to stick on the jar, and number two, the list of ingredients meant that it could well have been from the 80s and just had nothing happened to it. The two biggest ingredients were mustard and vinegar, so that might explain why it hadn't gotten moldy after so many years. But even so, it was still really weird that someone had chosen to live in what was basically a working museum. As you can probably imagine, the bedrooms and bathroom upstairs were all in that same 60s, 70s style kind of thing, so I won't describe them in too much detail. Only two of them seem to have been used any time recently, one as a guest room and the other as an actual functioning bathroom. Loads of the clothes in the cupboards of that main bedroom looked really dated, but I would pictured a lot of old man clothes. I don't quite know what old man clothes are now that I think about it, maybe flat caps or woolly jumpers or something. I don't know, but definitely not these flared jeans and bright orange low-cut t-shirts. It was about then that the museum idea really started to make sense in a weird way. As I carried on cleaning, I remember thinking, it's probably some rich guy who bought up his childhood home and he's made it like some type of time capsule kind of thing. It's quite a nice idea if you think about it, not that you'd catch me spending that kind of money on something like that, but still, different strokes for different folks as I say. Anyway, I'm just minding my own business when I suddenly hear a door closing downstairs. It had to be the living room door, as that's the only one I'd left open, and although I hadn't heard the front door opening and closing, I assumed it was the lady who paid me come to see how I was getting on. I called out down the stairs something like, Hello, I'm up here, and then waited at the top of the steps, expecting the woman to appear out of the living room. I remember waiting for an uncomfortably long time, just standing there, getting more and more nervous as the silence got creepier and creepier. In the end, I walked down the stairs, into the living room, and then into the kitchen at the back, following what I thought was the intruder's route. The kitchen had a door into the back garden, one that should have been closed but was now wide open. I walked into the back garden, expecting to find someone like a gardener or a plumber or something, but there was no one there. The back garden was totally empty, and that's when it hit me. The intruder hadn't come in the front door. They'd come in the back door and slam the living room door as they'd walked into the hallway, the opposite direction I'd assumed. I retraced my steps, went back into the house's main hallway, then into the one place the intruder could have gone, which was the front room I'd already cleaned by that point. And you guessed it, it was empty. That's the point where I actually started feeling uncomfortable. I mean, so uncomfortable that I didn't want to be in that house alone. If someone for some reason was now in the house with me and evidently didn't want to be seen or heard, that's just about the most obvious red flag for danger I can possibly think of. Maybe they broke in thinking the place was empty, and maybe they ran out the back when they realized it wasn't. But if they were still in the house, hiding away somewhere, they might not think anything of clocking me over the head with something on the way out, or at least that's what my fear was anyway. I did another sweep of the house, armed with a cricket bat that I'd pulled out of a bedroom cupboard. I actually thought about calling in that help from a maid of mine too, but just as I was about to hit the dial, I thought of the money. We always did a 60-40 split, which meant handing him a hell of a lot of cash for a job that was two-thirds of the way through. I couldn't exactly lie to him about the pay. I'm not that much of a scumbag and it did make sense to have him around in case anything dodgy did happen. But then that little voice in the back of my head popped up like, stop being a fanny and just finish the job. 
So, that's what I did. Or tried to do, anyway. At that time, it was early afternoon, so after eating my packed lunch in the back garden with nothing really weird happening at all, I got cracking with the rest of the job. I finished cleaning the second floor bathroom, then got started on the two third floor rooms which had just been used to store junk. This was obviously much heavier work than the other rooms, but it was still relatively an easy job of taking it all out the front and throwing it into a skip. It was a lot of old furniture, wooden tables and chairs, nothing remotely creepy if you don't count all the cobwebs. There was just one thing I was really dreading, and that was the small loft space with a pull-down stair ladder. I thought about just ignoring it and hoping that I could get away with not cleaning it, but then all it had to take was one walk around and there was a good chance payment would be withheld until I'd clean it. Not wanting to take that chance, I got a torch out of my van, mustered up the guts to pull down the ladder stairs, then pushed open the little hatch at the top. My torch went in before my head did because I wasn't about to stick my head up into a dark space like that. So as I stuck my head up, I was shining the torch around, and then I saw something that had me almost falling back down the ladder in fright. In one of the two tallest corners of the loft, there was a figure. At first all I saw were these two dark eyes, shining back at me as the torch beam hit them. I scrambled back down a few steps, still seeing those big black eyes in my head as my heart started pounding in my chest. I think if I hadn't worked out what I was looking at in the next few seconds, I honestly think I'd have filled my pants, but as my brain worked overtime out of pure terror, it suddenly hit me that I'd seen those big, dark eyes before. Slowly but surely, heart still going a mile a minute, I stuck my head back up into the loft to see a gas mask staring back at me. It had been mounted on the top of some kind of mannequin and there was a military uniform underneath it that looked like it could have been World War I or II, that sort of era anyway. Sitting next to it was an old-fashioned luggage trunk with a big, hefty-looking padlock on it and it occurred to me that these might have been the personal private items that the woman might have been talking about. Aside from a bit of dusting, there wasn't much for me to do, but every second I was up there I felt like I was somewhere I shouldn't have been, and I couldn't bear to turn back on the mask and uniform because of how creepy it looked. I was very glad to be done up there, and after a quick once over to make sure everything was looking good, I gave the woman a call so she could come over and have a look and give me the rest of my pay. She turned up about 15 to 20 minutes later, and while I was still sat in my van looking up at the house, wondering what it was that felt so bloody off about it. She walked up with another envelope, and I started reeling off all the things that I'd been up to, mainly all the deep cleaning stuff like shampooing the carpet, getting all the grime off the window sills, and doing the same with all the appliances in the kitchen. I kept on like that for a minute hoping it'd justify the huge amount of cash that she was about to hand over for the second time that day and then something hit me. She wasn't bothered in the least bit about all the work I'd put in. She was more interested in knowing if I'd got on okay, as she put it. The only thing I thought to mention was the mysterious intruder I'd had just before my lunch break, how I was a bit worried it was some burglar or a smackhead looking for a place to shoot up. Now that, she did seem interested in, and asked me to tell her exactly what happened. She then told me what I'd long suspected, that she'd given the keys to a few different tradesmen who were all working on the place, so it could have been any number of them who'd stopped by to check something out or pick something up. It didn't make sense that they wouldn't announce themselves, though, but that's the explanation she gave me, so that's the only one I considered at the time. It's only now, with 20 years of hindsight and experience, that I realized how it wasn't just that incident with the intruder that was weird. Something wasn't right about that whole house. I remember how, before she drove off with the keys in her possession again, I asked the woman why the place was like a museum or something, why there didn't seem to be anything in there that was made after the early 80s. She said something about a man with dementia living there, and how he felt much more comfortable in that kind of setting. I asked if she knew the guy personally, and she said no. She just worked for a company that was dealing with the sale of the property. Again, it seems like a reasonable explanation on paper, but 
something about the way she said it made my bullcrap detector go off. I don't think that she was flat out lying to me, but I get the feeling that she wasn't telling me the whole truth and that there was a lot more story behind that house than I'd first guessed. I don't think that was a normal place that I went into that day. I know that's going to make me sound like some kind of flat earther or most haunted obsessed loser, but I mean it. I don't think that I was sent in to clean the place, not really. I think I was more like a guinea pig. Spend a few hours in there, rummage around, see what happens. I didn't get frightened or hurt or anything like that, but something did happen in there. Something I'd never been able to explain, even all these years later. I don't even think it was just that one weird incident with the intruder. I think something was wrong with the whole house. Or rather, not that there was anything wrong with it. It just wasn't like any place I'd ever been before, and, in a way, I just can't find the words to explain it. I sometimes think about asking around the old painting and decorating boys that I used to work with to see if any of them know anyone who'd worked in that house. Maybe it was just me getting a bit stir-crazy working all day on my own, but then again, maybe there's something about that house that's very different from any other. I worked in waste management for a couple of years back in the mid-90s. I know people who say they could never work a job like that, and not even because of the stigma that comes with it, which is very real by the way. I know you don't look down on garbage men, being the paragon of virtue that you are, but I think you know as well as I do that there's a lot of people that look down on the job whether they care to acknowledge that or not. That's why the salaries tend to be higher than you'd expect. It's not the early mornings or all the stinky, rotten stuff people think we handle on a weekly basis, either. By the time I got into it, all you did was hook dumpsters up to the truck, push a button, and then, hey, presto, garbage is gone without barely having looked at it. It's because people think less of you, subconsciously, too. But at the time that I applied for the job, I was more than accustomed to being looked down on. I spent the better part of my late teens and early twenties addicted to heroin, and although that whole saga would make for a horror story all on its own, that's not the story that I'm trying to tell you today. In fact, I don't even think this story is all that scary either. My life was never in danger. We didn't find a dead body or almost crush some homeless dude, which actually almost happens quite regularly, and I can't say that I suffered any sleepless nights after what happened here. But then, having said that, what I saw that morning made for one of the single most disgusting sights I'd ever seen, and it wasn't just what I was seeing either, it was what I was hearing. I guess that doesn't make any sense out of context, so I'll just get on with it. My route was up in the Hamptons, which might sound ironic to some until you hear this went down at a fish market. It was definitely the worst stop on our route, especially in the summertime, but since we were always within our rights to refuse to deal with a dumpster if we deemed it a biohazard, God bless the unions, the market was always very respectful and kept everything as secure, clean, and tidy as possible. But no matter how hard they'd tried to make it easier on us, rotten fish is always going to smell like rotten fish. No matter how many layers of trash bag you wrap around them, Anyways, they were mostly very considerate when it came to disposing of their waste, but there are always anomalies, exceptions that break the rules, and one morning, I came face to face with that exception. As we were driving up to the dumpsters, both me and the driver noticed something was off almost immediately. Usually speaking, each of the dumpsters would be closed and then locked with a hex key, something which came into practice to stop animals or homeless folks from getting in. But then on this occasion, each of the dumpster lids were open slightly, which looked like ripped open bags of rice with their contents spilling out into the ground in front. It's not entirely unusual to have someone try and use someone else's dumpster to dispose of their own trash, and since the fish market always kept their dumpsters in good order for us, I figured that's what happened on this occasion as well. They were always decent with us too, so I figured I'd just do them a solid, squish the lid down a little to make it all fit, and then hook the dumpster up to the truck to be emptied. 
Now, the dumpster is on the left side of our garbage truck, so as much as I could see the mess that we had waiting for us, I didn't get a great look at it as we rolled up. Neither did my driver, apparently, who was either too tired or too careless to look over at it himself, so it wasn't until I got out and gloved up that I realized something was wrong. The smell was way worse than usual. I mean, that was kind of a given, seeing that the dumpster wasn't closed and locked, but... It's just way stronger than I expected it to be. I masked up before walking around the truck and as I got closer to all the spilt rice, I started to hear this noise. It sounded like soft raindrops or like an egg frying in another room in your apartment if you kind of get the sound. Just this sort of faint rustling that I couldn't quite pinpoint thanks to my hood being up. And then it hit me. I wasn't looking at grains of rice made fat from some overnight rain. I was looking at maggots. And as I learned that morning, one maggot on its own doesn't make a sound, but hundreds of the little things all writhing around among the black plastic trash bags, it sounded like something sizzling on a skillet. I didn't exactly run off screaming or anything, it wasn't that kind of scary. I guess it was that moment of realization, connecting the dots between what I was seeing and what I was hearing, all those hundreds of little squirming maggots that had burst from hell knows what was stinking up that dumpster. I refused to even go near the thing, then told the driver once I got back into the truck, who in turn did this double take before going, oh my god, that's one of the most disgusting things I'd ever seen, which for someone working in waste management is saying a lot. Turns out our initial suspicions were true and that someone had hijacked the fish market's dumpsters with some kind of variety of meat or something. I feel kind of bad for him because it was the fish market that had to deal with it, and it must have made for one type of job, I can tell you that. Maybe they got some non-union extreme cleaning company in or something, I don't know, but either way, someone was in for a real horror show of a cleanup job. The weird thing is, that probably wasn't the worst thing I had to deal with, not on paper anyway. If I laid it all out and asked y'all to pick one, it might not even be the maggots. But I swear, if you were there with me and heard that sizzling, fried egg wriggling as all those maggots feasted on whatever rotten guts were in there, it'd stick to you like it stuck to me. In early November of 1975, a garbage man working his regular route around Redondo Beach, California, made a hair-raising discovery. After coming across one particularly heavy trash can, he decided to separate the contents in order to more safely deposit them in his truck's disposal unit. One trash bag seemed much heavier than the others, and as the garbage man carried it to the back of his truck, he noticed blood leaking out of the small tear in the thick black plastic. He dropped the bag there and then, terrified that he incriminated himself in some way and rushed to call the police. Within the hour, the cops had blocked off the street where the bag lay and after carefully opening up the black plastic, they discovered something horrifying. The bag contained the carefully dismembered remains of a young man named Larry Jean Walters. And the incident sparked a long and arduous criminal investigation, the goal of which to catch a killer the media had dubbed the Trash Bag Killer. Born on September 24th of 1939, Patrick Wayne Kearney was the eldest son of two hard-working middle-class parents. He was raised in eastern Los Angeles by a mother and father who did everything to ensure the happiness of their children. But as he advanced through the state education system, Patrick became the subject of relentless bullying. His skinny frame and sickly constitution made him an easy target for his crueler high school classmates, who often taunted him for his somewhat effeminate mannerisms. As a result, Patrick remained deeply closeted regarding his homosexuality, while growing understandably angry and resentful towards his bullies. Yet while many young men in his position would simply endure the treatment, until free to escape and live comfortably, Patrick allowed his torment to warp and twist his own sense of morality until the people that surrounded him could be placed into one of two categories, predator or prey. At around 13 years of age, 
Patrick began developing some extremely violent revenge fantasies involving his bullies. He imagined kidnapping them, nailing them to a wooden board, and then skinning them alive with a small but razor-sharp knife. He wanted to see them suffer. He wanted to see them hurt. But his small stature on top of how outnumbered he was meant that he was unable to seek retribution. And so, Patrick turned his violent frustrations elsewhere. It was around this time that Patrick's father taught him how to hunt wild pigs. The circumstances of these hunting trips aren't exactly clear, and some have even suggested that they were actually trips to a local slaughterhouse. But thanks to researchers from Virginia's Radford University, we know that shoot was the operative word Patrick used, so it's much more likely that his loving, well-to-do father believed a few hunting trips would both cement their bond and relieve the stresses of his classmates' cruelty. Patrick's father taught him that to kill with just one shot, he needed to shoot a wild pig just behind its ear. Again, it's not clear how proficient a killer Patrick was, but he took the lesson to heart and began practicing in his spare time. In all likelihood, Patrick went out into the woods with a small caliber rifle or BB gun and began to hunt small animals for sport. Some reports say he tortured survivors and grew to be fixated on the sight of blood, while others stated that Patrick, and I quote, found pleasure in rolling around in the blood and the guts. Between the ages of 14 and 18, Patrick and his family moved to Arizona and then Texas before eventually returning to California. Patrick then spent a few months at El Camino Community College in the city of Torrance, but dropped out to enlist in the Air Force at the age of 19. Following his basic training, Patrick returned to Texas in 1960 as part of his first duty station, and it was here that he met a fellow airman by the name of David Hill. The two men were kindred spirits, as Hill was also a closeted homosexual, and over the course of their service together they became romantically involved. Patrick and David then sought honorable discharges from the Air Force, and once they were granted, they started a life together in Long Beach, California during the summer of 1961. The men seemed happy for a while, but the following year, David announced that he was departing on a solo hitchhiking trip up and down the West Coast. He assured Patrick that he'd return by the start of summer, but it was an outright lie. In reality, David Hill had reconciled his relationship with his estranged wife, Linda, and when Patrick learned of this, he was heartbroken. In order to fill the void of his failed relationship, Patrick engaged in serial promiscuity and cruised for potential partners around the gay nightclubs of San Diego and Tijuana. He was met with a fair amount of success, but was also met with a fair amount of rejection, too. And while Patrick rejoiced in the former, he was completely emotionally unequipped to deal with the latter. Getting turned down enraged Patrick, and one night, a sudden series of them resulted in him throwing in the towel and driving back to Long Beach earlier than planned. On the drive back, he remembered the squirrels and peccaries he killed during his teenage years of the power he'd wielded over them in death. As Patrick drove, lost in thought, he suddenly spotted a hitchhiker at the side of the road. It was late at night on a lonely stretch of highway. The decent thing to do would be to pull over and give them a ride. But as the grateful hitchhiker climbed onto the back of his motorcycle, Patrick had a sudden and terrible idea. He drove the 19-year-old hitchhiker to a secluded area and told him to get off his bike. The teenager was confused, but when he saw that Patrick had a gun, he did as he was told. Patrick then told the boy to turn around, possibly under the pretense of robbing him, but when the order was complied with, Patrick aimed just behind the boy's ear and then shot him in the back of the head. Patrick has never revealed the boy's name, possibly because he neglected to ask. The squirrels and peccaries didn't need names and neither did the hitchhiker. Patrick also has revealed the location of his first murder and the victim doesn't appear to have been reported missing, yet Patrick was able to provide an insight into that too. He claimed he was driving in the same area a few weeks later when he noticed a second person walking at the side of the road. This boy was a little younger than his first victim and to Patrick, he appeared to be searching for something. 
Patrick claims that he asked the boy what he was looking for, only to be told that just a few days prior, his 19-year-old cousin had gone missing in the very same area. Patrick invited the boy onto the back of his bike, claiming that they'd be able to search a much wider area that way. Instead, Patrick drove the boy out into a secluded area and then repeated the process of marching him into the desert and shooting him in the back of the head. Once his victim was lifeless and still, Patrick began to indulge in a horrifying kind of nostalgia. The lifeless, bloodied corpse before him reminded Patrick of the small, furry creatures of his youth and how in death he was able to exercise total control over them. It's believed that Patrick mutilated and desecrated his second victim to a diabolical extent, disemboweling and skinning him as carrion eaters began to circle in the skies above. It was these first two murders, but especially the aftermath of the second, that cemented Patrick's desire to revisit those horrid games of his youth. Patrick partook in one more of those grisly games, all at the expense of an 18-year-old boy he referred to only as Mike. By that point, he was entirely committed to wreaking a terrible vengeance against a world that had so frequently humiliated him. But then, something curious happened. Sometime in the first half of 1962, when Mike was still just 22 years old, David Hill showed up on his doorstep. His former lover had attempted to rebuild his relationship with his wife, but found he'd been living a lie. He was in love with Patrick, and to pretend otherwise would be a disservice to both of them. What followed was a brief period of happiness and stability for Patrick and his prodigal partner. They'd moved into a small apartment together, and Patrick managed to secure a rather lucrative job as an engineer for an aeronautical company. In early 1963, Patrick experienced some kind of strife, potentially as a result of his relationship with David. As a result, he marched into his manager's office and suddenly quit his job. The circumstances of his resignation are shrouded in mystery, but Patrick was inexplicably rehired just a few months later as a senior research assistant. This amounted to a two-tier promotion for Patrick and is evidence that he was extremely productive and effective following David's return. The following year, David and a then 24-year-old Patrick would move to California's Culver City, and with the latter's additional income, they were able to rent a much larger property together. Again, it seems the couple experienced relative peace for a short time, with David officially filing for a divorce from his estranged wife. All throughout this romantic reunion, from 1962 to 1967, Patrick's bloodlust remained dormant. This is most likely due to the sense of happiness that came with his romance with David. For the first time in his life, things seemed to be going Patrick's way. But that newfound prosperity came with an overwhelming sense of insecurity. During the summer of 1967, Patrick invited David on a trip to Tijuana, and planned to show him his former haunts from his days as a single man. It was here that they ran into an old mutual friend, a man in his late twenties known as George. It seems that David and George had a definite chemistry between them, which inspired a vicious jealousy in an increasingly insecure Patrick. Just a few months after the surprise reunion, Patrick invited George out drinking with him alone. George may well have considered it a proposition, in reality, it was more of an execution. Patrick drove to George's home in San Diego, then talked him into having dinner with him back in Culver City. But then, the moment they walked through the front door, Patrick produced a pistol, then shot George in the back of the head. His dead body was then dragged into the home's bathroom, where Patrick violated, mutilated, and skinned and dismembered him over the course of the next several hours, Patrick also extracted the bullet from his victim's head to ensure the murder would not be traced back to him, then buried the dismembered body behind his garage. They say the act of murder gets easier with each passing victim, but George's murder marked the first time Patrick had killed out of necessity to defend what was his. There was no way in hell he'd risk losing David to someone he considered more mature and attractive, and he'd do anything, no matter how monstrous, to keep him. Not long after David was told that George had moved away, 
he and Patrick moved into a large two-bedroom home in Redondo Beach. It should have marked an exceptionally happy occasion for the couple, who owned their own home for the very first time, yet David was becoming increasingly concerned with his boyfriend's behavior. Despite being completely unaware of his murderous proclivities, David had noticed a distinct change in Patrick's behavior. He had become more and more coercive and controlling as the years went by, and as time passed in their Redondo beach home, the relationship steadily deteriorated. Eighteen months later, in June of 1971, Patrick woke up to an empty home. David's clothes were gone, his car was gone, all that remained of him was a handwritten note on the kitchen table. It's not clear what exactly was written, but it could quite easily be summed up with, it's over, and I'm never coming back. The abandonment was devastating to Patrick's mental health, and the revenge fantasies of his youth returned with a vengeance. Over the next three years or so, Patrick geared up for the killing spree of a lifetime, refining and perfecting his methods until he could kill frequently and discreetly. By the summer of 1974, Patrick was thought to be murdering unsuspecting victims at least once a month. He would cruise gay bars or keep his eyes peeled for hitchhikers, often choosing victims who bore varying degrees of resemblance to those that had bullied him during his youth. Then, once he had won their trust, he would execute them almost as soon as they climbed into his truck. He would usually shoot his victims just behind the ear with a small 22 pistol, holding the gun in his right hand while steering his truck with his left. This mobile method of murder ensured minimal exposure to potential witnesses with a customized seatbelt mechanism making sure the bodies of his victims stayed upright in the passenger seat. Patrick also ensured that the bullets in his 22 caliber pistol were of a relatively low gunpowder yield, meaning there were rarely any exit wounds following the gunshot. The rounds simply scrambled their brain matter, killing or disabling them, and thus allowing Patrick total control over them for what came next. Patrick would then drive the corpse of his victim to a secluded area of Southern California before intimately violating and desecrating the remains. He would sometimes violently assault his victims following this period of copulation, screaming the same homophobic epithets that had once been directed at himself. Having completed his acts of sadism, Patrick would dismember his victims with a hacksaw before depositing their butchered bodies into a series of trash bags. These bags would then be dumped into various locations such as landfills, along freeways, or in random dumpsters Patrick came across while on his travels. During his earlier murders, Patrick seemed content to leave the bodies of his victims to turkey vultures or coyotes. It certainly made for an effective, natural way of disposing of bodies, but it also meant that Patrick had to relinquish what he saw as his property to a bunch of hungry animals. Interring the remains in trash bags, as well as choosing the location that they'd be dumped, allowed Patrick to extend his level of control over his victims, yet it also posed a problem. Disposing of human remains was grisly work, and the stench of death meant remains were often discovered just hours after they'd been dumped. So to avoid any unwanted attention from law enforcement, Patrick began draining his victims' bodily fluids prior to their disposal. This dramatically slowed the onset of any foul odors, a process Patrick would double down on by bathing the bodies of his victims in bleach and dishwasher detergent in order to cleanse away any forensic evidence he may have left. Although Patrick mostly targeted men in their early or mid-twenties, his obsession with his own childhood bullying caused him to direct his anger at the occasional adolescent or child victim. Patrick's youngest known victim was five-year-old Ronnie Smith, who vanished from Lenox, California on August 24th of 1974. His body was discovered just less than a month later in the state's Riverside County. The same fate befell eight-year-old Merle Chance of Venice Beach, who disappeared on April 6th of 1977 while riding his bicycle near Patrick's place of work. Patrick chose to finish his shift early that day, then it headed out into the parking lot to gain the boy's attention. Once little Merle was in his truck, Patrick discreetly smothered the boy before driving him back home for the night. The next morning, after placing the boy's chopped up body into trash bags, 
Patrick dumped Little Merle's remains in the Angeles National Forest off Angeles Crest Highway, approximately 11 miles north of Altadena. On June 16th of 1976, Patrick came across 13-year-old Michael Craig McGee, who was hitchhiking between the cities of Lenox and Torrance. Michael has a long history of petty criminality and would often leave his home on long trips around Southern California. This made him an ideal target to Patrick's despicable proclivities, who won the boy's trust before inviting him on a camping trip that very weekend. Michael agreed and was driven back to Patrick's home to prepare for the trip. Patrick later claimed that he had every intention of making good on his invitation, at least until Michael presented himself as what Patrick referred to as a threat. According to him, as soon as they arrived at Patrick's Redondo Beach residence, Michael began boasting of his extensive criminal history and began wandering around the house as if scanning for potential points of entry. It seems Patrick hadn't been the only one looking for a victim that day, as young Michael may well have perceived him as a potential target for robbery. In light of that, Patrick waited for an opportune moment and then shot the 13-year-old in the back of the head. Michael's body was never found, and although Patrick later admitted to murdering him, he was also quoted as saying, I disposed of the body, completely disposed of it. You aren't going to find him. Eventually, Patrick's targeting of adolescent males led to his demise, particularly the slaying of 17-year-old John Otis LeMay, who was killed on March 13th of 1977. That same day, at around 5.30 p.m., John informed a neighbor that he was headed over to Redondo Beach to meet a man named Dave, who he'd befriended during a visit to a local gym. The Dave in question here is undoubtedly David Hill, Patrick's former lover, and the fact that he directed the young man to Patrick's home is deeply suspicious. David was later cleared of all charges against him after it was alleged that he played an integral role in the murders committed by his former boyfriend, but the fact he directed 17-year-old John to Patrick's home is very suspicious indeed. There's a chance David had no idea that his lover was such an inhuman monster, but at the same time, it's unclear why communication between him and Patrick had been re-established following their second and supposedly final breakup. Regardless, John LeMay arrived at Patrick's house to find the homeowner wasn't expecting anyone, and when asked if David was around, Patrick told him no, but invited him inside to watch TV while they awaited his return. And then, at some point, Patrick reached for his 22, then shot John in that same familiar spot, just behind his ear. By the time John LeMay was killed, local law enforcement had already placed Patrick on their list of suspects. A local butcher, Jerry Stevens, who claimed Patrick visited his shop regularly, told police that he was a loner with an eerie sense of quiet about him. He also noted that Patrick inquired about the best way to butcher an animal and would ask which knives the butcher used to ease the cutting of joints and bones. Yet Stevens was perhaps one of the only people aside from David Hill who got even the slightest inkling of what a monster Patrick Kearney was. Patrick's employers at Hughes Aircraft saw their model employee as something of a neurotic and accepted that a person with as high an IQ as him, believed to be in the 180 range, often came with their own personal eccentricities. Throughout the course of their investigation, law enforcement were informed that John LeMay and David Hill had been spotted in each other's company, and given David's connection to Patrick, both were announced as wanted for questioning. Patrick initially fled to Texas, but during the summer of 1977, David convinced him to return to California and turn himself in. Patrick then gave a full and frank account of his 15-year career in killing but insisted that David Hill had been party to none of them. Despite what many have suggested, forensic and circumstantial evidence point this to being true, and David was later released without charge. In total, Patrick confessed to a jaw-dropping 35 murders, pleading guilty to all of them in order to avoid the death sentence. He was subsequently ordered to serve life without parole at California's Mule Creek State Prison. It's a cruel reality that many, many children endure periods of bullying in their lives. 
the vast majority of them get over it and go on to lead happy and fruitful existences, but some, Patrick Kearney included, allow their torment to shape and define them. Patrick may have believed that he was striking back at a world that had wronged him, wreaking a terrible revenge against those that had bullied him, but the truth is, in becoming a vicious, bloodthirsty, predatory deviant, Patrick handed his bullies the kind of victory they could only dream of. They treated him like a freak, like a monster, but instead of showing them his capacity for dignity, integrity, and ultimately forgiveness, Patrick gave in to the lesser angels of his nature and ensured his name will forever be associated with some of the most heinous acts of evil in all of criminal history. Long-time listener, first-time caller. The story isn't mine, but it's my friend's, but he can barely write a text message, let alone an email, so I'm writing this for him. He used to be a garbage man for a while, back when we first graduated high school, and he has this really messed up story that he likes to tell from time to time that legitimately creeps people out. So, one morning, he's on his regular route, and he was one of the guys that jumps off to grab the garbage cans before emptying them into the truck. He'd said as soon as he and this other dude got off the truck, they started seeing all these missing cat posters attached to streetlights and telephone poles. They said the cat's name was Boots, I guess as in Puss in Boots, and had a cell phone number and picture attached too. Sounds kind of out of pocket, I know, but my boy and his co-workers started making jokes about how little Boots probably got his ass run over while out looking for lady cats. They're still just laughing it up when my boy comes across a real stinky trash can, which they always used to check on account of, I don't know, not wanting to get crap on them or something. Homie takes the lid off the trash can just to make sure that there's no surprises waiting for him and there's little Boots, bashed and broken dead as can be. My friend goes to check the missing poster and finds that the house the cat is missing from is on the same street they're on. Not just that, but the trash can Boots was found in belonged to the neighbor of the house he was missing from. He's thinking the neighbor really did run Boots over with his car, maybe by backing out of their driveway without looking or whatever. But whatever happened, the right thing to do was to go up and tell the homeowners what happened to their cat. He says he felt kind of bad after making jokes about it and they were about to stop at that same house anyways to collect their trash, so that's what we did. He says it was a weekday morning, kind of early, and he could see lights on and people moving around, so he figured he was good to buzz the front door. He hears some moving around inside, then the sound of someone running to the door, and then when it opened, there's a kid just standing there, like, yeah? My boy asked the kid, hey, is your mommy or daddy home? And the kid replies, uh, mommy's in the shower. And my buddy then is kind of lost and doesn't know what to say, so he asks the kid, does your family own a kitty cat? But then the kid just shakes his head. He says he was a little confused for a second, like maybe he'd read the wrong house number on accident or something. But then he looks up to see the house number is right there on the door in front of him, so he definitely doesn't have the wrong house. My friend then says, are you sure you don't got a lost kitty or something? And again, this kid just looks back at him, completely expressionless, and shakes his head. Right then, the kid's mom appears, dressed, but their hair is up in a towel. She then shoes the kid away from the door, and then asks what my buddy wants. My homie then tells the lady about her dead cat, and she obviously is pretty upset, so... He asks if she wants him to bag the thing up and bring it over so they can give Boots a little funeral or something. The lady decides that they're going to tell the kid that Boots went to live on a farm upstate, as they always do, and that they'd get a new cat so the kid would just move on and forget about it. Pretty solid plan for parents, I guess, and the lady thanked my buddy for letting them know, and then she kept on talking about how upset Lucas was going to be, which I guess was the name of her kid. Boots was his best buddy, his most favorite furry friend in the whole wide world. He wouldn't be able to handle such terrible news, not at the age that he was. He wasn't ready. All very understandable, right? My buddy says how bad he feels for them, wishes them a nice day, and the lady thanks him again before closing the door. 
So he gets back on his route, finishes up, and then he said the whole time that they were back in the depot, sorting all the garbage and whatnot, the kid's reaction was just burning a hole in his head. According to the mom, that kid loved that little cat, and the prospect of him finding out that it was dead terrified her. But then the kid straight up acted like he didn't even own a cat. I get that the kid could have just been super shy or whatever and just said no because they were spooked by the stinky stranger guy who had just appeared at their door. My buddy says that too, that he hopes it's just the kid who was too shy to talk or something because his other theory creeps us out too much to even really think about it too long. According to my friend, the kid wasn't what you typically imagine when you think of a shy kid. You know the kind of thing I mean not making eye contact, hiding behind the door and refusing to even say anything. The kid was the total opposite. He didn't seem scared at all. He stared back at my friend all deadpan and he didn't even flinch when he mentioned little old Boots the Puss. That's what my boy kept thinking back on at the sorting depot, how incredibly creepy that kid had acted considering the circumstances. All that thinking led to a real dark kind of conclusion and honestly, if it all went down exactly the way he said it did, I think I kind of believe it. It might be a hotter than hot take, but screw it, I'll say it. I think the kid hurt Boots. I think he didn't like his dear old kitty cat nearly as much as mommy thought. I think she mistook the kid's interest in the cat as affection when, really, it was something else. It wouldn't be the first time a kid deliberately hurt an animal like that, right? I mean... Isn't that one of the warning signs when a kid's destined to grow up to be a serial killer? But then to me, the really scary idea is that if the kid really did kill his cat, he was smart enough to put it in the neighbor's trash can and not his own, like he was trying to cover his tracks or something. To me, that's like the first signs of the kid's evil genius coming through right there. So young, but already picking up the tricks of the trade, you know? And the story doesn't even end there. My buddy worked the route for months afterwards, always passing the same house at the same time on the same day of the week. Sometimes, not all the time, he'd seen that little demon kid staring at him from a window with the same sort of dead stare that he had when he lied about having a cat. Bro, it gives me the creeps just typing it out, I swear. My buddy said passing that house topped his list of things that he hated about that route. If that were me... It had topped the list of things I hated about my whole life. Creepy adults are one thing, but creepy kids. They're the real nightmare fuel, if you ask me. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. I release new videos every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday at 7pm EST, and there are super fun live streams every Sunday, Tuesday, and Thursday night. I'd love to see you there. If you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations and bonus content over on Patreon, or click that big join button to hear about the, all the extra perks offered for the channel. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all of these stories and big compilations and save huge on data located anywhere you listen to podcasts. All links in the description below. Thanks so much, friends. And remember, video killed the narrator.